Hello, and welcome to this session entitled Scaling for Mexico Climate Impact, a research program making update from FP Climate, uh, first um, Founders Pledge Climate. Um, I'm Zukit Chan, and I'll be the MC for this session. Following that presentation, we'll move on to a live Q&A session where we will respond to your questions. You can submit questions through a swap card live discussion feature. Then after 15 minutes, we'll bring the session to an end. But now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the speakers for the session. First, we have Johannes. Johannes joined the research team in autumn 2019. He brings like five years of experience working in a think tank advising decision makers on climate policy and has also researched the intersection between effective and feasible climate policies. We'd like to have Megan. Megan joined Founders Pledge in 2022, shortly after finishing her PhD at Caltech, where she focused on solar photovoltaic device uh, physics research. She is passionate about climate impact and mitigating existing and ever impending climate change on our planet. At Founders Pledge, she works on the climate research team using data to make the biggest climate-based impact. And next we have Dr. Ashwara uh, Susana. Uh, Dr. Ashwara is a climate researcher. She's a Robbins JSD fellow and uh, a master's student at UC Berkeley. And she passed the California bar, um, awaiting to hear uh, from NPRE. Um, she's a lawyer, researcher, and entrepreneur with experience in law and technology, international co comparative law, nuclear non-proliferation, civil nuclear liability and regulation, sustainability, and clean energy. That's clearly a very decorated background. <laughs> Um, I'll pass it back to uh, over to you, Johannes. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, can you all see the screen already? The presentation? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Good morning, good evening, uh, everyone, where, wherever you are. And yeah, so in the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to talk about uh, scaling for maximum climate impact. And this is kind of, yeah, research and grant making update uh, from Founders Pledge. Climate. Here's uh, the run of show. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem we're trying to address and kind of the, the solution approach we're choosing. Then Megan and Ms. Varyak is going to demonstrate the solution kind of uh, at scale, how we're currently operating. And then I'm kind of I'm going to talk a little bit about solutions at scale at the end. And yeah, just to be uh, kind of uh, super clear, this is not uh, kind of a conversation, or it's, it's not a presentation kind of about like how do we solve the problem of climate change. We've uh, given presentations on that before. And yeah, for example, you can also listen to my 80,000 hours podcast where I discuss this a lot. Today, we're really kind of trying to answer a different question or address a different problem. And the problem really is more um, a methodological one, and that's kind of about climate, but Apply similarly to other cause areas, which is really about like how do you maximize impact if you're in a space that is kind of characterized by lots and lots of different uncertainties. Yeah, and to kind of uh, start with this, like what does the problem actually look like? So yeah, why is maximizing climate impact hard? So when we're kind of in this effective altruist project of we want to maximize impact, what does it actually mean? And why is it hard to kind of answer in the climate space? And there's kind of I guess one way to think about it is that if you want to like optimize for climate impact, you have something like three different dimensions that you kind of need to optimize for at the very minimum, right? So the first one is kind of you want to optimize across time because like many of the actions that you take, many of the best actions that you take will usually kind of sometimes take years, sometimes even decades to kind of fully materialize their effect. So for example, if you think about the diffusion of solar, which kind of took about 30 years kind of from, from start to kind of having a material impact on the mission. That's a good good example of something that looks very bad in the short term, it's transformational in the long run. So one dimension across time. The second dimension is kind of you want to optimize across space, right? So like the impacts are often kind of not where you're acting, right? So again, the example of solar is kind of destructive or like not very sunny places like Germany kind of pushed very much ahead and kind of the impact is very global. So kind of, yeah, optimizing for, for impact, you also want to look at like what are the impacts over, not only over time, but also over space. And then also most subtly, you want to kind of think about different futures, right? So since you're essentially addressing the problem uh, that's kind of keep us busy for the next decades or centuries, you need to kind of think about like what kind of, what is the solution profile? How do different solutions kind of are robust or not in different uh, kind of conditions? So for example, if you're kind of thinking about uh, solutions that require international cooperation to work well, right, that's kind of 
one set of futures have so like solutions that kind of depend on that will not kind of work and like we're also like there's very little kind of international cooperation there's a lot of geopolitical competition so you also want to optimize for that right so that's kind of the basic problem that you're facing and or that we're facing uh, day to day and to kind of make this a little bit more concrete so if we're kind of looking at what should we be funding, right? How should we allocate 30 million or 10 million or whatever amount? So there's kind of the decision of like filling a funding gap. So we might or might not fill a funding gap. And let's say then the charity conducts advocacy uh, with this uh, with this money. Maybe there's no policy change. So maybe the effect is zero. Maybe there is policy change. So there's kind of an effect in the first, uh, in the first, in the, in the first instance. But maybe the policy actually fails to produce the desired outcome. So let's kind of say the policy is like uh, get the money together for a demonstration of advanced geothermal. In principle, let's say the money uh, is there, it's kind of mobilized, budget is mobilized, but then it kind of uh, fails to actually uh, be built. So that's kind of one thing that can always happen. Another thing then, okay, let's say the policy actually achieves a thematic outcome, right? It kind of does the thing it was supposed to do in the world. But then again, there's kind of different um, options what would happen, right? If we're kind of sticking with the geothermal example, maybe we're building the thing, maybe we're kind of seeing, okay, it's not cost competitive, and maybe it will have very limited um, global impact. So that's always a possibility. Or it could have really a transformative global impact, right? That's also often a possibility. So, and if we kind of think about like how uncertain we should be for all of those steps, right? Like how much uncertainty we have, right? If we're kind of looking at, if we fund this, but someone else fund this, and climate given is a very crowded space, it's almost always kind of accounting for other people potentially funding it, but it's always uncertain, and I think often uncertain about something like at least a factor of three, uh, whether or not we're additional. Then there's kind of the second layer, which is the advocacy, what's actually the leverage from advocacy. So I think at least the uncertainty of something like a factor of 10. What does the policy actually do? Again, at least an uncertainty of a factor of 10. And then of course the global effect, um, at least an uncertainty of 10. So kind of, and you kind of multiply those things together. And I think in this case, we kind of can multiply them together because they're kind of different steps along a chain. It kind of tells you have like an uncertainty of at least like 3000 X. And then if someone asks you kind of this typical um, EA question of like, does this meet the bar for funding? Does this meet the bar for high impact? The rational response of things to kind of like say shrug and like that's like, okay, and that's actually really hard to say, right? Because they're having like vast uncertainty. And yeah, to just kind of understand this a bit better, what is actually the problem and what's actually what makes this hard? So and I think there's kind of two things, two main things. The first is that like the uncertainties are often a very large and layered, right? So we kind of saw this in the example, the uncertainties kind of go into sequence. And the second one is kind of that the uncertainties are really irresolvable on action relevant uh, time scales, right? So it's not about, okay, if the RCTs haven't been done, let's spend a year funding the RCTs. Like that's not um, a solution to the problem because the uncertainties are about like long run processes such as like, technological change, policy change, um, yeah, what, what kind of the adoption of technologies, et cetera. So all kinds of things that like, once we know whether, how effective they were, like it's kind of delayed, needs to take action under uncertainty. But then luckily there's also kind of some things that make this a little bit easier. And two things in particular, and we're gonna like really exploit those, those features of the decision making the situation easy, easier. The first is that the uncertainties are often independent. So you can multiply them throughout. Or you know the structure of the uncertainty. So like you know that some effects are negatively correlated, for example. So you can kind of model this. And this is kind of one thing we have going for us to trying to solve for this. Um, the other kind of really important part is that the uncertainties often apply similarly to different options that we're considering, right? So we can kind of, even though we will be very uncertain about the absolute cost effectiveness, we can say something about relative effectiveness. And that is really kind of the bottom line here of kind of this, this first section. Like the approach that we're kind of uh, going to introduce is really about getting credible comparative statements. Or even if we're in a very high uncertainty situation, as we are with climate, when we think about interventions spending decades and spending the globe. But even though we can't really 
get a good grasp of like absolute cost effectiveness, right? It might be uncertain by a factor of 3,000. We can still say reliable things about relative impact. And that is what ultimately matters because we're trying to make the best decisions and allocate money in the best way possible. So we're kind of always, um, always comparative. Yeah, how do we actually approach solving this? And in principle, the, the way that we're, we're doing this uh, is that we're building lots and lots of different tools and those tools kind of operate at different uh, levels of abstraction. So like if we're kind of looking at very specific interventions, say like innovation advocacy or addressing carbon marketing, we're kind of trying to build mechanistic tools that kind of capture what we know about these processes to have like credible estimates. And we're also doing a lot of work kind of analyzing for additionality, for funding additionality in particular, because we find a such a crowded space that you really need to take into account what other people are doing. And then we're kind of trying to aggregate this on a higher level of impact multipliers and like differentiating variables. And if this doesn't make a lot of sense right now, that's totally fine because we're going to spend the rest of the presentation making this more clear. What does I'm kind of yeah, handing over to Megan, who yeah, is going to talk with us through some examples and kind of a lot of the tools that she's been building uh, throughout the year. Thanks, Johannes. All right. I will now take us through how we actually solve these um, different scenarios in this problem through some of the tools that we've built for this past year and walk us through the different impact multipliers. Okay, so for the rest of this comparison, I'm going to walk through a simple case study where I'm going to compare two different similar organizations that both work in the innovation space. So for this example, our theory of change is innovation. And specifically, the two organizations that we're going to look at are just mock-up examples. Organization A is a carbon removal advocate in Europe, which is going to be green for the rest of this comparison. And organization B is a supporter of advanced geothermal innovation in the United States. So in order to actually compare these two organizations, we want to compare several different attributes that um, we can use to compare the two. And the first attribute that we're looking at is advocacy. And when we say advocacy here, what we're um, referring to is the ability to leverage societal resources through philanthropy. And we believe that there is an inherent impact multiplier from advocacy through our philanthropic work, but we have high uncertainty about the amount of impact that advocacy results in. And so what we're seeing here in these plots is this middle section, this blue, that blue um, plot, are the potential states of the world for advocacy itself. And so we see that there's uncertainty, there's fairly uniform uncertainty, that's anywhere between five and 20 as an impact multiplier for advocacy. And then right above and below, directly above and below in yellow and red respectively, we have the organization A and B characteristics towards advocacy. So the attributes uh, for advocacy for these two organizations. And essentially we believe that organization A and B both leverage advocacy as, the, as two separate charities. And we have no reason to believe that one leverages advocacy more than another. And so we believe from, as we can see from the outermost distributions, which is a multiplied through characteristic time state of the world, that they should have the same advocacy multipliers. So if we move forward, we now take into account um, for our next slide, we take into account with the tools that we have built out, which is a causal chain that is able to calculate potential averted emissions through advocacy for policy change. And again, specifically here, we are looking at a theory, our theory of change as innovation. And so what our tool is able to do is use an input amount of advocacy dollars that is meant for policy change to determine what the technological change of the underlying innovation would be. So in this case, we're looking at technological change via cost decline curves. So this first curve, we see what the cost decline curve would be without advocacy dollars in the solid line. And the dashed line right below that solid line is the 
accelerated cost decline curve as a result of the additional advocacy dollars. Now, as a result of these cost decline curves, we can then plot the projected capacity curve, so the energy diffusion of such an innovation, again, with our solid lines indicating the no advocacy uh, projected capacity and the dashed line indicating what additional capacity we would have given advocacy. And finally, with this delta, with this difference between the advocacy and no advocacy diffusion, we're able to calculate what additional overt emissions our advocacy would result in. And so with this tool, we can now include what the additional multiplier from innovation should be for a theory of change of innovation. So if we go forward, we can include that in our, in our distributions. So what we see here now is, once again, we have this central states of the world distribution, but now instead of a uniform distribution, we're able to simulate and calculate what the innovation uh, what the multiplier for innovation itself should look like. And we have a, a normal distribution. Now, again, for organizations A and B, since we are looking at similar organizations that are both in the innovation theory of change, we have organizations that leverage this theory of change. So we once more have similar um, multiplier values for A and B, given that they are both in the innovation space. However, our tool also allows us to compare across different types of innovation. So if we go forward to the next slide, we can see that we've run 11 different types of technologies in our tool. And what we can see here in this first column, the average cost effectiveness, is the cost effectiveness in dollars per ton CO2 averted. And I just want to point out here that this dollar per ton is for additional tons of CO2 given advocacy, not the total um, cost effectiveness of the technology itself. So this is the cost effectiveness specifically for the advocacy policy change, advocacy induced policy change. And so what we see here though, is that there are um, several differences between the different technologies and there are differences in the uncertainty. So we have this, we have the 80% confidence interval and the 90% confidence interval displayed here. And so we can see that with these 11 different technologies, we have different expected cost effectiveness from advocacy and different amounts of uncertainty within each. And we can take it a step further and actually look at the distribution of any given technology. So here what we've plotted is the super hot rock geothermal distribution. And we see that there is a heavy tail distribution where we have some very high cost effectiveness, meaning it is not cost effective because it costs a lot of money to avert a single ton of CO2. But we see that the vast majority, the greatest density of our simulations are in that highly cost effective region on the left side. And we can take this further now and compare different technologies. So if we go back to our organization A versus B example, our green versus purple, we have carbon removal or direct air capture versus geothermal. And we can see that these distributions of expected cost effectiveness from advocacy induced policy look different between these two technologies. For the direct air capture, we have a, um, we have a, a policy cost effectiveness curve that doesn't have as steep of a drop off as the super hot rock geothermal curve. Um, and here we are plotting specifically in the same x-axis of zero to ten dollars per ton for the cost effectiveness, but we have for the super hot rock, as you saw from the slide before, there's a much heavier tail. The super hot rock, even though the direct air capture in that um, the zero to ten has a wider spread and less of a drop off. So what we can do though is we can divide out these two expected cost effectiveness distributions, so the direct air capture over the super hot rock geothermal to give us a ratio. And so what we see here from this ratio is that the vast majority of times, over 90% of the time, direct air capture has a higher cost um, effectiveness, meaning that it is more costly to avert a single ton than super hot rock geothermal. So even though the super hot rock geothermal has a wider distribution and more uncertainty, the vast majority of the time, it is more cost effective to um, implement advocacy for super hot rock geothermal. So given that we have these differences that we're able to 
identify in our tool for the different types of innovation, we now want to also represent this. So what we have is once again, we have innovation, then we specify which type of innovation in the yellow and red respectively, and finally we multiply it out in the green and purple distributions. Next, the next thing we wanna take into account in addition to the type of innovation is where is the innovation happening? So if you recall, our organization A was carbon removal in Europe, and our organization B was advanced geothermal in the US. So those are two different regions that we want to take into account as well. So we've also built a tool that is a follow up of work. It's a reanalysis of the work done by ITIF in 2020, where we have used that data and updated it slightly to um, assess innovation capacity in different jurisdictions. So here what we're plotting is five different jurisdictions and their innovation capacity, as well as 90% confidence intervals. The way that we've actually calculated this data is through three different um, categories being early stage innovation, capacity for late stage innovation and market readiness, and commitments and international collaboration for low carbon innovations. So what we can see here is that for our organization A versus B example, which is the EU and the US, the two highest bars, they're pretty similar. The ultimate modifier value is the median modifier or average modifier value is pretty similar um, with high uncertainty for both. A bit more uncertainty for the US than the EU, but in terms of specifically EU versus US, they have similar innovation capacities. Where this would really have a big difference is is if we were comparing, for instance, the US versus India, which we see has a very different innovation capacity calculated. So now when we put this together into our distributions, once again, we follow the same states of world in blue, the respective yellow and red for EU and US, and the final multiplied out distributions in green and purple, which again, look similar here because of the fact that the US and EU have similar innovation capacities. But you can see that the red is a bit more uncertain, has a bit wider of a distribution because we had that um, higher confidence interval or wider confidence interval from that bar graph in the previous slide. Now we move forward and the next thing we want to account for in this analysis is how robust and hedgy these solutions are. So the concept of hedginess is a bit complicated. I'm not, given our time constraint, I'm not gonna go into too in depth of a explanation, but there's an entire 80,000 hours uh, podcast if anyone is um, interested in listening. But essentially what we're trying to understand with hedginess is in the worst worlds possible, when we are in the highest climate damage scenarios, how does that compare? Um, how do the different innovations that we're looking at, how could they hedge against these different worlds? So our organization A, for that organization, we expect that carbon removal would require high coordination and willingness to pay given its cost point, which seems unlikely that it would be in, available in these types of high risk, high climate damage worlds. And so we give it a hedginess percentile of about 20 to 40. Whereas for organization B, which is a clean firm power innovation being geothermal, we expect that this clean firm power type of innovation would hedge against variable renewable constraints. And that even in the worst worlds, it could succeed. Um, and so for that reason, we allocate a 60 to 80th percentile hedginess for organization B. And so we take these different values and once again, input them in our distributions. And so you can see that our red distribution for organization B is further to the right. There's, again, it's a bit wider because there is more uncertainty. Um, and we, once again, multiply through our hedginess distributions. Then next we implement another um, concept being the organization strength. And here, similar to as the uh, characteristic describes, we're assessing how strong we expect the organization, the charity to be. Here we show that they are similar in expected strength with a bit difference 
in the uncertainty for A versus B. And then next, we implement a, another tool that we have built out, which is around funding additionality. So here what we're seeing in this, um, this multi-square plot is essentially how much funding there is in the different sectors in different regions that are shown here, where we have sectors on the top and regions on the left. So what we're looking at is the squares that do not have as much blue are the sectors or, and regions with less funding. So our teammate Luisa has built out a Monte Carlo simulation that is able to track and estimate trajectories for these different sector region pairs to show us where funding is, but not only where funding is, but how much it's been accelerating year on year. Because what we really are looking at here is, is more funding going into this specific sector or are we additional when we want to fund this type of innovation? And so here we're looking at three different areas being clean energy in the US, the green line, clean energy in Europe, the blue line, and carbon dioxide removal in Europe, the red line. So we put this together with our impact multiplier framework to once again, plot out distributions here to fill out the distribution work. And now once again, we have um, the funding additionality as a discrete one for the states of the world because they're uh, that we then multiply around. So we have our yellow and red distributions here where our yellow distribution is how additional is funding for carbon removal in Europe versus how additional is funding for advanced geothermal in the US. And as you can see, we have a bit more funding additionality expected for geothermal in the US, once again, with a wider uncertainty, as it's then reflected in the green and purple uh, multiplied out distributions. So we can then use this ultimately to bring everything together and calculate an expected value for organization A versus B. And the way that we actually calculate this expected value is the product of the all of the green um, distributions on the top and all of the purple distributions on the bottom. And so what we see here, what the takeaways here are, is that organization A, again, the carbon removal in Europe, has a distribution that is much more uh, left-leaning and more, most of the time has a lower expected value. And in fact, if we look at the actual values, we see that organization B has a higher expected value of 123 compared to organization A of 3.7. But as you can see from this heavy tail and from all of the heavy tail distributions that we kept feeding into organization B, there's much more uncertainty um, in organization B than organization A, as is also shown by the deviations, the standard deviations in the parentheses. However, we ultimately show from these distributions and from a comparison of the two, that 91% of the time organization B dominates organization A. So even though there is much more uncertainty of the exact expected value for organization B, we know that 91% of the time, so a vast majority of the time, it dominates over organization A. So now moving forward and just zooming out a bit, I just want to remind us where we're at and where uh, Johannes had set us up for. So until now, we've compared relatively similar things, which, yes, we could have compared more mechanistically, but we wanted to show how each of our tools work, because right now, all we've looked at is the innovation theory of change, but there are many different theories of change, and we want to be able to show that we can use these different tools in across different theories of change and be more broad. So our goal is to have a credible comparison across these diverse theories of change, including policy leadership, paradigm shaping, driving innovation, which we just went through, but of course we want to continue with, catalyzing promising organizations, mitigating political risk, 
And finally, avoiding carbon lock-in, which will be the focus of my colleague Ashwarya's section right now. With that, I will introduce Ashwarya to continue the talk. Thank you, Megan. So I'm going to zoom into carbon lock-in and talk to you about that uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, carbon lock-in occurs when the existence of carbon-intensive infrastructure prevents a country from transitioning to alternative clean sources and locks the country into a high carbon trajectory. The reason why we should care about carbon lock-in is that despite the fact that clean energy sources are becoming cheaper and more reliable, we still build and operate a lot of coal. I'm going to demonstrate this with the example of India. On the right, you can see the graph which shows the energy mix of India over time. Uh, and you can see that coal is still a very big part of it. India remains highly reliant on coal, uh, which makes up about 88% of its um, electricity mix, uh, despite the fact that there is considerable policy support for clean energy transition. Part of the reason for this is that India has a relatively young fleet of coal power plants between 13 to 21 years um, in operational years, and the average lifetime of a coal power plant is between 40 to 45 years. So India's coal power plants still have a very high utilization rate for the next uh, next few decades. And to drive this point further, if you look at the graph on the left, um, it shows sort of what it means when a country decides to build a fossil fuel facility in terms of uh, emissions committed over time. So as you can see, we've already committed um, significant emissions from the electricity sector all the way into 2060. So overall, it's a very difficult economic argument to make to a country uh, once it's built a bunch of fossil fuels to just replace them or retire them. And they tend to have very high utilization rates for uh, their entire uh, lifetime. Uh, next slide. And to sort of dive further into considerations um, that go into sort of weighing the pros and cons of prioritizing carbon lock-in, we look at um, the states uh, of the world that need to be true. And uh, as discussed earlier, despite there being policy support um, and financial viability of clean energy sources, there is still significant carbon intensive build out, especially in the emerging economies as they experience rapid economic growth and uh, energy demand uh, alongside that, which would limit the impact of innovation, research and development and clean uh, energy technologies because of the reasons I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, however, there's also uh, considerations that speak against prioritizing carbon lock-in. Uh, one of them is that when you're thinking of carbon lock-in, you're very focused sort of on parts of the world where you see severe carbon lock-in uh, currently and in the future, which is mostly in emerging economies. Uh, so it can be difficult to see that sort of global impact. Secondly, there could be very limited tractability uh, in changing and fixing carbon lock-in and have to uh, policies in general are very difficult to change. And there's considerations of energy security and demand that make it especially challenging. And then lastly, there's also a few um, intent intentional success stories uh, to draw uh, learnings and more insights from. So taking all these considerations together and looking at the cost effectiveness of um, carbon lock-in, um, on the left you see what we currently believe uh, about this. So uh, if you look uh, at the top uh, graph on the left, it shows the cost effectiveness of the innovation theory of change. And then at the bottom, you see our current belief uh, about the cost effectiveness of carbon lock-in. So as you can see, if we had to make a best guess, currently the cost effectiveness of carbon lock-in is um, maybe lower. But then again, this is just Sort of the cost effectiveness of the theory of change in, in isolation and then looking at um, philanthropic and funding trends um, of carbon lock-in in, in emerging economies uh, seems to be quite neglected. And with all that, um, we think it may, uh, the cost effectiveness may be higher. But again, as is shown in this very spread out distribution, we're quite uncertain about this, and which is why I'm spending most of my time trying to uh, fully grasp what carbon is. Lock-in interventions look like and how they work. Uh, 
Um, so speaking of interventions, what are things that we can do to fix carbon lock-in? Broadly, two things. Um, first, we can avoid upfront carbon lock-in, which is a further build-out of new fossil fuel facilities. If you look on the right, um, you'll see these graphs generated from our acceptable emissions tool, which was built by our, our alumna, Violet. Um, on the top, you see Kenya. Um, the red shading shows committed emissions, which is existing fossil fuel facilities in a country, and the light orange shows the considered um, emissions from future facilities that we expect would be built there. Um, so currently there is uh, relatively less committed emissions in Kenya. However, with more growth of the country, we're expecting it would be quite carbon intensive and there would be more fossil fuel build out. So it's very important in a country uh, like Kenya to avoid uh, this reliance on fossil fuels to sort of fuel uh, growth. And then secondly, um, you see the examples of Indonesia and China. Indonesia is kind of in the middle where there's uh, some committed emissions, but then very high um, considered emissions in the future that we're expecting uh, due to economic growth and energy demand. And um, in a country like that, it is not only important to avoid upfront carbon lock-in and avoid new fossil fuel facilities to be built, but to also um, focus on abating or reducing emissions from existing facilities uh, by retiring them early, uh, which could include interventions like repowering uh, with clean energy sources, retrofitting, uh, et cetera, which is especially important for a country like China, where you see on the bottom right, uh, significant committed uh, emissions from existing facilities. And it's very, very important to try to uh, retire, them, uh, retire them early. And with that, I will pass it on to Johannes to talk about solving these problems at scale. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm going to speed up now, so we still have 10 minutes for questions at the end, but just to kind of contextualize why are we doing this and how does this all fit together. So solving this at scale, right, I guess the first thing to, to rescale is to actually triple the team. So this year we tripled the team and you, uh, the full-time team you've just heard uh, from Ayan and Tishbaria, uh, building lots of different tools. And then, of course, right, so like the example that Megan was kind of talking through was kind of this relatively simple pairwise comparison. Uh, like uh, kind of this, this very cute stylized case, stylized case. That's of course not what we're doing it uh, for ultimately, right? So it's just for illustration, but ultimately we want to comp uh, compare and um, fund the best kind of like of tens of organizations, right? So comparing tens of opportunities and essentially generating quick initial judgments on different charities based on essentially one hour grant idea uh, forms that people uh, can submit. So we're kind of exploiting all of the of knowledge about impact differentials in the landscape to kind of form uh, credible kind of first impressions of different charities. And this kind of will, will create a situation, I'm sorry, I'm going, going really fast now. Um, so to really create a situation where we're having an integrated uh, research and grant making model. So in a way we're having, yeah, we're having all of these different uh, models of impact, all of the different kind of models to understand how impact is distributed. Uh, we're sourcing lots of different uh, fundable opportunities. And then what we get out of this is both kind of like an optimal allocation given our current uncertainties, but also kind of what the most action relevant uh, uncertainties are. So for example, if you recall uh, from, from Meng's presentation, the most action relevant uncertainties would have been about probably about like the technological uncertainties because they were kind of differentiating the two options. So they could have split, um, switched twice between the two opportunities. And yeah, all of this is kind of like an airplane we're building um, while also flying the airplane, right? So we have to make a lot of uh, grant decisions all the time. So it's just to kind of, uh, yeah, very briefly talk about some of the decisions uh, that we made this year are kind of moving forward. Those of us that kind of know um, the our historical work, right? So we did a lot of work in high income countries focused on innovation. So in the United States, uh, Clean Air Task Force, Carbon 180, Terra Praxis. Something we've just been adding is kind of thinking about uh, mitigating political risk. So now that kind of there's more money in the, in the innovation response overall, we're kind of policies is doing better in the US. And it's important to protect it. So we're kind of supporting an organization that's focused on building bipartisan support for climate policy in the US because political risk is kind of one of the 
major threats there. And then, of course, also work that's kind of outside the US, which oftentimes is also kind of a hedge against the, the larger uncertainty that you, that you saw for the US case, which comes from political risk to a large degree. So yeah, in the past, we've been a support of future things like architects, focused on Europe, and we're now also going to support a harm-free Europe and also focus on yeah, European decarbonization technology, inclusive decarbonization, and Cascade Institute, which is focused on advanced geothermal in Canada. And then for the work kind of in emerging economies, uh, yeah, two things to highlight are just kind of like from the committed emissions side that is why I talked about, we're doing a lot of work on repowering or quantified uh, carbon, which is kind of focusing on all repowering in all of emerging Asia. And with Tsinghua University focused on China in particular. And then we're also kind of right now in the process of finalizing a ground to energy for growth, which is really focused on addressing those considered emissions, kind of making sure and unexpected emissions, making sure that electricity um, sectors are reformed in emerging economies so that you can get the diffusion of clean energy sources at scale. Yeah, I'm going to skip this one. I'm just going to close on this so that kind of the people, the tools, and the organizations that we've created for tons of impact. And yeah, you can support uh, our work and follow our work and under special climate. You can also give, of course, if you're some kind, that's kind of the operated uh, climate opportunity. If you think of the can you can also give. I'm sorry for rushing this a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we get some questions in. And with this, I'm handing over to you too. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Johannes. Yeah, so, uh, wow, Johannes, Megan, Dr. Ashraya, thank you for that very, very comprehensive, data-rich presentation. I think it created lots of excitement in the audience, uh, as, as I can see from the chat function. Um, I see we've had a number of questions submitted already, so let's kick off with the first one. Uh, we only do have eight minutes, so I just want to tell the audience that there is an office hour session happening right after this. Uh, so y'all can definitely hop on that if you have further questions that we couldn't cover. So uh, let's, uh, I, I also want to quickly shout out the podcast resource that you mentioned repeatedly, Johannes, um, the ADK podcast uh, that was uh, that, that y'all did in April. I listened to that podcast and I really enjoyed that, your, the way you frame how uh, it's between two com competing forces, uh, mechanisms. One is uh, technology and innovation and the other one being, um, uh, uh, I couldn't recall it, a specific phrase. So let's go to the first question. Um, I would love to, uh, so this question is from, uh, uh, so, so man, no, uh, so Mena asks, I would love to learn more about your methodology. Do you have a publication that discusses the methodology that you use, or can you re recommend a publication that you've been inspired by? Uh, and feel free, uh, if anyone wants to take the question, feel free. Yeah, feel free to go. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take this one. Uh, I mean, we're going to publish uh, new stuff in the next couple of weeks, but a lot of what we talked about is kind of um, related to a blog post that we did earlier in the year in April on the EA forum, so kind of talking about credible comparison and high uncertainty um, context. And if you go further back, a lot of this is kind of inspired by the changing landscape report, which we wrote in 2021. What is distinct about what we're going to publish uh, going forward is essentially putting the tools into action. So kind of we're going to see the things that today is the first time we've, that we showed this and uh, yeah, we're going to publish this. And, yeah, in the next couple of weeks. Nice, nice. Um, and uh, Megan, uh, Dr. Ashraya, feel free to jump in if you'd like to add more uh, uh, later on as well. The next question is uh, from Matt. Matt uh, asked two questions, so perhaps we could roll in the same. I think it's around the, the uh, we will make your model code and assumptions public. If not, why not? I can jump in here. Um, we will be making our models public. We just have not published um, our work yet, but as Johannes was saying, that is the plan for the next few weeks is to write up a publication around all the work that we've been doing for the past year. So really, and this kind of goes back to the building an airplane or right, driving an airplane while, while we're building and flying and all of that. Um, <laughs> but that goes back to this entire year has been about tool building. And now we're at the point where our tools are built and we want to publish those results and we will publish the actual uh, tools as well as a result. Uh, and just a quick follow up on this, like, is there um, uh, someone in the audience wondering if uh, if that's a key limitation of your model, if, that, uh, if it only includes upsides and not downside risks? So um, the question is like, are there plans to add downside risks 
from advocacy that you support. Yeah, absolutely. So if we think there's a significant uh, downside risk, we'll absolutely uh, model that. And there's, there's no reason to, to not do that from the, from the tooling perspective, right? This would be another uh, variable, right? So for, if you're talking about technology diffusion, you wouldn't model the downside risk in the same tool, but like you would definitely kind of yeah, include that. I guess one thing to jump in and add is our models are not specific to any given variables. They're all, nothing is hard coded. So we add in multipliers as we see them and additional variables as we see them. So we're not specifying only upside or downside. We are very much making it as inclusive of all information as we get the information. Okay, and then just a question for the speakers to think about in the back of your mind in the last four minutes that we have. Uh, is there like any takeaway? Uh, I'll ask it in the end later, but is there any like last minute uh, takeaway actions that you'd like the audience to take after the EJX virtual conference? So something to think about uh, as we move on to the next question. So the next question uh, we have is from Emily. Emily asks, uh, curious if you have thoughts on REN.co, that's W-R-E-N.co for climate offsets. Do you all collaborate with them? Yeah, so I'm gonna kind of take that because I wrote a lot on carbon offsets over the years. Um, so I think our general take on carbon offsets is in that there's two parts to the take. One is that we're generally not not keen to talk a lot about offsets because we're gonna see offsetting as like an inherently very limited kind of moral vision of taking action. So we kind of never never want to push a frame that's about offsetting. Uh, and I think the second part of it is that essentially there's there's essentially no good carbon offsets, right? So like either you have like very expensive kind of high quality carbon removal offsets that are kind of in the hundreds of dollars. And that also where like if you buy them right now, they're kind of, um, you're actually not buying additional um, reduction because there's so much demand for them. Or you're buying offsets that are quite bad and that are cheap, but actually not really expressing reduction. So it's kind of not something we're looking into and it's kind of something we're kind of actively advising people away from. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to note to the audience that if y'all are curious about this, uh, Emily Tai uh, gave a talk yesterday um, on the current offsetting thing, and she she was talking more. I was emceeing for that session, and she was talking more about how uh, it's not actually that promising, uh, even despite its popularity among the aviation industry. So it's, um, for the audience, uh, you can definitely check out the past uh, virtual talk wins release by Emily Tai uh, on this topic. Uh, so we do have time for one last, uh, what second last question. Um, so the second last question, uh, I see the upvotes have changed. I'm going to ask this instead. This question is from Jonas. Jonas asks, what are the primary misconceptions that make people donate or pay to offset ineffectively? What information would it be most effective for us to spread? Yeah. Um, so the key misperception around offsets is that they're seen as certain, right? So like philanthropy is always, I mean, what we're showing you right now is like, Cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness expectation, but extremely uncertain. And like lots of people or lots of institutions will kind of avoid this and they'll kind of say, we want to go for something certain. But the certainty with offsets is actually an illusion because essentially most offsets don't have integrity. So you're you're always making a gamble. There's something like a 20% chance there's something that your offset actually reduces the machine. Um, yeah, so kind of essentially pointing out that uh, the certainty of offsets is fake. Um, and that you have to deal with uncertainty either way, and then you might as well deal with uh, uncertainty in the, in the light where you have at least a potential for high cost of All right, folks. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Dr. Ashwarya, go for it. You know, I also just wanted to sort of chime in and say that um, just, you know, from my observation, what I've seen just in general, like philanthropy and how people look at different types of climate change solutions, there's some solutions that just look you know, more certain, they just look more interesting and, you know, they appeal more. And this kind of creates the scenario where people are thinking about just one type of um, uh, one type of climate change solutions. But like, I think it's very important to think sort of more broadly and ask questions about where can we have the most impact? What are things that are needed that there's not enough, um, enough work on? And so sometimes um, sort of more, um, complicated sounding solutions like policy advocacy and like you know, carbon lock-in and things like that. They don't um, 
immediately sound like the obvious things that you would think about or like the popular uh, things you would think about. So really sort of keeping in mind the neglectedness of uh, solutions where they are most needed, I think is also extremely important. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashwaya. So uh, we are tech, so I'd love to uh, ask my uh, last question just to uh, just so audience can take home with like a, a, an action they can take after this conference, uh, maybe as a collective or maybe individually, uh, what's your 10 second bumper sticker? If you're going to put a billboard in, uh, in the center of place, uh, you know, calling people for like an action, what would that be? Um, Johannes, Megan, Dr. Ashwaya. I can, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, take political action, including donating, including spreading the word about changing the climate conversation. Those are my 10 seconds. I guess Megan's 10 seconds. Yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, use evidence, use data to make decisions. Don't just follow the bandwagon, especially in climate. There's a lot of bandwagon following, and that's not going to be the highest impact necessarily. Dr. Ashwari? Ashwari, yeah. Yeah, and, and for me, it's, it's sort of relating to what I was saying earlier. Don't just follow mainstream solutions. Think, uh, be sort of cognizant of certain solutions being neglected. Follow the data, repeating Megan, and uh, don't just follow the mainstream. And with that, that is all the time we have. That concludes the session. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you for our lovely speakers, Johannes, Megan, and Dr. Ashwar. That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.